God, amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you, dear Lord, as we celebrate the Feast of the Cross, the cross which is the sign of your love for us, the sign of the power that you've given to us, your children. We pray, dear Lord, that the power of the cross would be the source of success and triumph in each of our homes as we fight the mighty battle, dear Lord. We pray, dear Lord, that we would have a victory in every home, dear Lord, bringing every home under your reign, under your supervision, under your guidance, under your protection, under your will, and under your purpose. I pray for this meeting. I pray for all those who have come here. I pray for all the Sunday school classes right now. Be with them in their classes. Be with the teachers. Be with our priests and all your people who call upon your name through the session of St. Mary, all your angels, all your saints, hear us when we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As I did last week, I'm going to ask you guys to come up because the Sunday school classes don't like me to speak really loud so they can have their classes. So, we're continuing our series on the Triumph Project transforming our residences into unshakable, mighty prayer houses. I gave everyone assignment last week. One thing I asked, how many of you prayed together as a couple? I quit. I'm done. One thing, this project is not going to work unless you get together and pray. You guys, this is so critical. It's not so that we can say we did a project. It's actually for your home. Let me reiterate this. There is a battle going on for your home. It's already going on. Whether or not you win it or Satan does, that is entirely in your hands. The excuses that we make to not battle for our homes is all on us. We said if there's one thing that's worth fighting for, it's our families. And if there's one way we're going to do it, it's through families praying together. We cannot make excuses anymore. I'm not even going to come back next week. That's, I'm not even coming next week. And I still want you to pray together as a couple. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about prayer in general and how to begin to pray because it is such a difficult thing. You will struggle with prayer for your entire life until your last breath. Satan fights prayer almost more than any other spiritual activity because prayer is your greatest weapon to defeat him. It makes sense. You know, they say that the devils in the monasteries, they wake up when the bell rings to wake up the monks. Like while the monks are sleeping, they're fine. As soon as they wake up to prayer, then the devils start their work. That's going to be our battle too. Because he knows that the way for him to be defeated is through prayer and humility. So you know the path to victory, and it's up to you whether or not you commit to it. So, St. John Chrysostom wrote this about prayer. He who is able to pray correctly even if he is the poorest of all people, is essentially the richest. And he who does not have proper prayer is the poorest of all, even if he sits on a royal throne. Now, to think of yourself as being poor because you're not praying correctly. I mean, most of us may not think of us that way, but he says you're the poorest of all. Prayer is like oxygen to the spiritual life. Have you ever seen what it's like to be gasping for air? We probably haven't had to deal with this a lot. You say, well, that's not me. Physically, it's not. But for many of us, spiritually, that is not something that we would picture ourselves as because we're not giving our spirits what they need. But literally, that's, that's what we are, so many of us.
There's a sin that all of us commit quite regularly. And it's a sin that we don't talk about much. And Samuel talks about it in this verse. Samuel the prophet, they were asking him to pray for them and he says, as for me, far be it from me that I should stop. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. He says, there's no way I would stop praying for you. That would be to sin against God. We're commanded to do a lot of things, right? We're commanded to love. And so we love. We're commanded to pray. Prayer is a form of love. You all know that. And so, I don't know if we realize the sin of prayerlessness, although you may be doing very many good deeds and you have not killed anyone this week. This is a sin that many of us are falling into all the time. I myself am very much guilty of this. And the problem is because we feel as though we don't need the prayer. And that's the problem. We haven't seen that we need prayer like we need oxygen. A holy person once said, tomorrow is a very busy day for me. I better start the first three hours in prayer. Most of us have the exact opposite. Tomorrow is a busy day for me. I don't have time for God. This person said, I've got a difficult day. There's no way I'll get through it without him. There's no way I'll get through it without him. And I wonder how many jobs would just go down the toilet if you stopped for 10 minutes to pray. How many of your jobs would be at risk if you interrupted your day for 10 minutes to pray? None of us. Most of us say, I may not be able to take an hour to pray. But could you take 10 minutes if you felt like you needed it to get through the rest of the day? Many of us are saying, well, prayer is going to take me forever. I know you're all saints, and when you pray, you pray for hours at a time without stopping. But bring it down a little bit. And what if we prayed for just 10 minutes? So, there's a few things in order to get into the habit of prayer that we need to do to kind of get ready for it. So prayer is a very difficult thing and there are certain things that will help your rhythm of prayer. First thing is setting a scheduled prayer. Now from today, the prayer that you pray with your spouse, I want you to schedule it today. Do not wait until Saturday to schedule it. Schedule it before then. But if you don't if you don't put prayer in your schedule, it's the one thing that you are so willing to push off, right? If you set your prayer in the evening, you say, I'm going to pray in the evening. There comes a really long, like an overtime in a football game, it's done. If the movie takes longer or whatever, it just goes away. If you schedule your prayer, how many of us have scheduled prayer in our, in our calendars? We might. There might be one of us who does. But if you have a scheduled appointment with your boss at 9 a.m., you don't miss it for anything. If they call you say, sorry, I'm in an appointment from 9 to 9.30, no one is allowed to talk to me. I was just reading a book about this recently, and he was talking how crucial it is that if you don't put something in your calendar, it won't happen. Like how often do you say, I'm going to work out three times a week? but it's not on your schedule once. And so you don't work out once. If I could have you do one thing today, among the many other things that I'm gonna ask you, schedule prayer today in your calendar. Say, this is the time that I'm meeting with the boss. You have to put it in your schedule. When is the best time to pray? When is the best time to pray? in the morning, before your day is cluttered. Because how many things interrupt you at 6 a.m.? Very few. How many from 8 a.m. until 10 p.m. interrupt you? If you can schedule a prayer for 15 minutes, you know, there are times where you've had to wake up or something, you say, I cannot miss this. You've had to wake up at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. You say, no matter what, I have to wake up at 3 a.m. 
What if you had to wake up 15 minutes early? You had to wake up 15 minutes early every single morning to meet with the creator of the universe. Pope Francis is big, but God is bigger. If Pope Francis was coming to, you know, like they're like, oh, I'm gonna go. What about God who waits every single day? I really am begging you to please set a time. Now, another thing about the time, not just what time you do it, but the length of time that you're gonna pray. So some of you say, well, I'm gonna pray at 9 a.m. And you don't know when it's gonna end. And so you worry about the time. And so you're distracted the whole time, saying, oh, what time is it, what time is it? Set your time, say, I'm only gonna pray for 15 minutes or 30 minutes. When it's 30 minutes is over, that's it. End your prayer so you don't worry about it. And your schedule will continue. If it's 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes. But please, set a time for your prayer because you don't want to rush your prayer. It's really sad when you're with like your spouse and say, listen, I only have 10 minutes and so I have 100 things to tell you. And so you talk about all of them, but you really got through none of them. And you felt like that didn't count at all. So set the length of your time and don't rush through your prayer. Don't rush because you will walk away the same as you did before, but you will tell yourself, at least I said some words to God. Setting the time is critical. The other thing is setting a place. Now, setting a place is important. It should be comfortable, but not too comfortable. I want it to be a place where when you go there, it feels like this is where you want to pray. It should not have a bed in it. It should not have a computer screen, and it should not have like Facebook or phone. Like it needs to be a place where you find comfortable. So the worst place to start your prayer is in bed. It starts off like this and it ends like that. Okay, you'll never remember what you prayed about the night before when you start off your prayer like that. So it needs to be uh, important. Many places have a family altar. How do you guys have a family altar? It could be a corner of your bedroom. It could be a part of your uh, walk-in closet or if God allows you to have another room. But simply a small table, some icons, some candles, incense, Things that encourage or inspire you. If it's pictures of nature that remind you of God, if it's a picture of Christ on the cross, if it's a picture of St. Mary, what a verse that makes you, inspires you, let that be the place where you go to meet your Father. If you don't have a place, and I've been there, you know, in, or in different living situations where I didn't feel like I had a place, I didn't want to pray. It needs to be the place where you want to go and relax in front of God and spend time with him, but he gets all your attention. Now there are people who live in huts that have a prayer corner. So anyone who lives in America clearly has room for a prayer corner this big. It doesn't need to be much more than that. So our excuse for not having a prayer corner is we just don't want one. Let it be the place, I, I recommend carpet, don't do marble or tile, like if you do bow, if you, on your knees. Is it nice to have cushions? Absolutely. Put cushions, let it be a place, let it be, there be a wall there. If you want to, there's times you just want to sit and meditate and you don't need to be on your knees or standing all the time. It's comfortable enough where you want to spend time with God and it's not so hard and uncomfortable that you want to rush out because you can't take it anymore. You have to schedule time, you have to make a place and choose the appropriate posture. Is sitting good for prayer? It can be. I recommend starting off with standing or kneeling, but then there are times in your prayer where you feel like, I just want to sit and think about God and talk to God and I don't want to worry about getting tired or whatever. So sitting is okay, but always start off with a posture of respect and worship. The other thing is the other thing I want you to set up is uh, prepare mentally. 
So the fathers say when you pray, you cannot rush into prayer. You have to mentally prepare for prayer. There's a story in the Paradise of the Fathers where a monk, before he would go into the cell after he was walking, he would walk around it several times. The other monk would say, why are you walking around your cell? He says, I'm leaving my thoughts outside. If you pray without your mind, St. Theophan the Recluse says, it's actually not prayer. He says this, not every act of prayer is prayer. Standing at home before your icons, or here in church, or venerating them is not yet prayer. These are the equipment of prayer. Reading prayers either by heart or from a book, or hearing someone else read them is not yet prayer. But only a tool or method for obtaining and awakening prayer. I'm going to read this next part because I want you to pay attention. It says, Prayer itself is the piercing of our hearts by pious feelings towards God. It's piercing of your hearts with pious feelings towards God, one after another. Feelings of humility, submission, gratitude, forgiveness, heartfelt prostration, brokenness, conformity to the will of God. All of our effort should be directed so that during our prayers, these feelings and feelings like them should fill our souls. That's pretty big. Like you can't just go into prayer and come out the same. Your mind and your heart have to be there. St. Theophan Recluse, he says, two, he says, there's one rule. He says, understand what you are reading and feel what you are understanding. Let me say that again. He says, understand what you are reading and feel what you are understanding. No other rules are necessary. That's it. Feel what you're praying and understand what you're saying. We're going to get into the Igbeya in a couple of weeks. I know that's everyone's favorite, favorite, top, like, favorite topic. It really is an amazing thing when it's taught well. And I'll show you the components of prayer in it. And you can find that it could be one of the greatest tools for your spiritual life ever. But we'll get into that. But I want to read to you what he says about focusing on the words. He says, keep your attention focused on the words of your prayer, knowing in advance that your mind will wander. When your mind does wander during prayer, bring it back. When it wanders again, bring it back again. Each and every time that you read a prayer while your thoughts are wandering, and you read it without attention and feeling, do not fail to read it again. He says, if you're reading a prayer and you didn't feel it, don't move on. Read it and read it and read it until you have felt it. It makes no benefit to have read more prayers without feeling than to pray only one prayer with intention and understanding. God's not looking for a quantity of prayer. He's actually interested in the quality of prayer. Are you meeting Him in your prayer? Then he says this, he says, A particular word or phrase might act so strongly on the soul. And we'll get to this in the Igbeya. But sometimes you're reading something and it really moves your soul. That the soul no longer wants to continue with the prayer. And even the lips continue praying, the mind keeps wandering back to that place which first acted on it. In this case, stop. Don't read any further. So there will be times when you're praying and something that day moves. And this is how the Igbeya is amazing. When you read different lines and something different stands out to each time, then all of a sudden, if you don't sit and grab that as a pearl, you just move on, you'll miss tons and tons of pearls. You never know when that one verse or that thing is going to be with you throughout the day. That verse might guard you, inspire you, move you towards God's will. So it's important that you have your mind in it so that God can move your spirit for you to feel and understand. Now the last thing I'm going to do is this. I really want us to talk about the goals of prayer. And I just wrote down a few of them. Most things we do without a goal ends up being very ineffective. But when was the last time you entered into your prayer corner and you says, I have to accomplish this 
I don't want to say words, but I really want worship. I want to be sanctified. I really want to show God my gratitude. I don't want to say words of thanksgiving, but I really want Him to know my heart is full of thanksgiving. A lot of the time when we have unstructured prayer, you want to know the part that oftentimes is missing the most? Is worship. When was the last time you on your own, you said, the heavens declare the glory of God in your own prayers? And you stood up and said, you who feeds the birds and ravens. There's a verse in the Agbeya in the evening prayer where it says, like you, rain, you pour rain on the mountain so that the grass grows even there. And you name the stars by name, each one. You think, this is describing a God who has really struck you and moved your heart. You're thinking, this is an amazing God. Like when I think about the God who cares about the birds that are on the mountains where no one else is, I'm thinking, what an amazing God. If He can care about those things in the middle of nowhere, He can think about me too. Oftentimes our prayers, when they're not structured, are all about me, my needs, my desires, my plans, my family, and my happiness. But really, worship is so critical. Could you imagine praying without worshiping? You see, that actually doesn't make sense. So there should be a time of where you just sit and reflect on how great God is from the beginning. Because if you begin with praising God, the next part becomes easier, which is sanctification. What is sanctification? It's where the cleansing happens or we become more holy. Well, how do we become more holy without the cleansing from sin? When you sit and imagine how great God is, you begin to realize your smallness, you begin to realize your weakness, your sinfulness. And then we begin to say, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. There are times, and I really want you to focus on this in your prayer, the best time to confess is in a prayer. Every single one of us has done so many sins. If you won't even talk about it with God, the chances of you talking about it with a priest are much less. But also, if you don't talk about it with God, you probably are not even acknowledging that you're doing it. You're just continuing in the sin over and over. I'm sure every one of us can remember a time where we were burdened by a sin and there was a time where you got on your knees, you put your face on the ground and you said, God have mercy on me. Please forgive me. And I bet every one of us remembers that prayer and I bet you can think of it and you probably can't remember another prayer that you've prayed. The most relieving prayers the most relieving prayers are the ones where I beg God for forgiveness for a sin that has bothered me. You know how we say we pray and we don't feel close to God? Those top two really help you feel close to God. You've seen how amazing He is, but then you felt personally that you have been healed. If you were to stop there, that'd be great. But we always, you know, say, well, what should we pray about? What should we do? Thank God. And when we thank God, don't stop at the material. When you read the Thanksgiving prayer, what do we thank God for? For having covered us, our sins, for having helped us in our salvation, for covered us, helped us, supported us, accepted us unto Him, brought us to this hour. Those were all spiritual things. Not one time does he mention, thank you God for my job and my house and my family. It's all about what God has personally done for me. It's nice when I say, oh, thank you husband for, you know, going to work and doing all this. But it's another thing to say, thank you so much when you gave me personal attention. Thank you there for being there for me when I really needed you. Thank you for lifting me up. Like those are the things where like a husband will say, wow, my wife really appreciated me. She didn't say the general things. She said the personal things. 
God knows that you love Him when you have something specific. How many things happened to you this morning already that you have something to be thankful about? You want to know the happiest people on earth? The happiest people on earth are the ones who are thankful. There's a poster my parents had in a random place in the bathroom, which I don't know why it was there, but it was this. Happiness is not having what you want. It's wanting what you have. If you're thankful, you feel as though it's Christmas all the time. I just received a new day. I just got to speak to someone who received a pronouncement of a terminal illness last week. They told him he's going to die. And I told him, you know, I don't know when I'm going to die, but if I wake up tomorrow, I'm thankful. They may have given you five years, but tomorrow is a reason to be thankful. To come to here, to be with this, to have this. I mean, there is so much for you to be thankful. And if you are questioning for one moment, go and visit Syria right now. Or go visit the path from Syria to Germany right now. And we, like, you could spend all day being thankful. But if you're not thankful, you're always wondering where God is. When you're always thankful, you know that He's always watching over you. You have to worship. You have to be cleansed. You have to be thankful. You have to align your will with God's. Praying is not about informing God your decisions. He knows them. Praying is about discovering what God's plans are and asking for help to follow them. Most of us are always, want to know everyone's favorite topic. Growing up from the age of like 13 to like 87, what is God's will for my life? Oh, what do you want to, what is God's will? Like, why don't you ask Him? Why don't you spend your time before Him and say, you lead me, you direct me, I know what I want to do, and I've messed up a lot, now tell me what you want to do. Most of us go throughout a day thinking, well, what am I going to do today? I have no direction. What if God spoke to you that morning and said, this is my will for you today. I want you to touch someone's life. You may not have heard that message if you didn't ask. You told him what you wanted, and he's waiting for a chance. Intercession for others. It's awesome when prayer is about somebody else. I want you to pray for your spouses. And I want you to pray for your kids. But then I want you to pray for everybody else. There are so many people. Is there anyone here who does not know someone who has cancer right now? Is there anyone who does not know someone who has cancer? Everyone does. My mom just got killed. She's 77. I'm sorry to hear that. No, she she healed. She got oh, healed. Oh, she got healed. Yeah. Oh, she got healed. Yeah. No, that's. I'm not. I'm happy to hear that. Sorry, I thought you said healed. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's fantastic. But there's people that are suffering all over around you. Your next door neighbor, someone who's depressed, someone who's lonely, someone who's sad, someone who's hungry, someone who's a Syrian refugee. Do you pray for people that are in prison? You ever pray for people that are in prison? I get these emails about Christian pastors that are in prison in like Iran or and I'm like that's horrible I met a blessed lady in Michigan she told me she prays for prostitutes every day I thought that's awesome because who else is praying for them maybe no one is praying for them maybe God put something on your heart that is one of the most beautiful things I've seen in a church when a church gets together to really pray and intercede for the behalf of someone else. A church did it for me eight years ago when I had a tumor, and the church gathered together and they prayed for me several days later. I'm out of the hospital having brain surgery. I'm attending Halloween with my family in the church, and it was like, it was everyone's prayers. Nothing moved me as much as everyone, and some people said, Mark, I've never prayed like that before. You know what? Sometimes God wants you to pray for someone else, to move your heart, to open and see that God has a concern for so many people and He wants someone to ask about them. We pray for those who have no one to pray for them. That's in one of our prayers. For those who have no one to pray for them, we pray for them. 
those who have no name. Think about the situation where you would want to be prayed for. We could probably be praying for a president right now. We definitely need a president. Should we say, oh, I hate all the candidates? Why don't we pray for all the candidates? Why don't we pray for, like, change? And you want to know the hardest thing to do? When my father confession told me this. There was this person when I was in high school. I did not like that person. She was annoying. I'm just going to leave it at that. And he said, turn your judgment into prayer. How hard is it to pray for that annoying person at work? The boss that just has no sense of God in their lives and you are dying for them to be different. You say, God, I know that there's suffering inside. When you are on your knees praying for them and God answers, you say, God is alive. And the last thing. I want there to be a prayer that changes your attitude. I can tell when I had a good prayer when after usually it's in the morning where I really enjoyed God's presence and the thing that I want to go do is go downstairs and hug and kiss my wife and kids. I am not this pleasant when I wake up. But if I have a prayer between waking up and seeing my family, they don't know. When you have that time with God, that prayer, you just want to go and love people and embrace people. Then you said, you know, God made a difference to me in my life. I just want us to pray together and as individuals. It's really hard to pray together if you've never done it on your own. So I really want you to set a time, set a place, clear your mind, and then have a goal of your prayer. Next time you go to pray, say, I have no idea what I'm going to say, but I know I need to worship, I need to be cleansed, I need to be thankful, I need to ask for His will, I need to intercede for somebody, and then I want myself to be changed. It's like, how could you go to a physician, the healer and physician of our souls? He's a surgeon and a counselor. We have, if we're not going to be changed by Him, who will we be changed with? Now, those of you who have heard me talk about prayer have heard me say this verse. This, to me, is almost the ultimate complete prayer in one minute. If you learn this prayer, you can pray it on your way in the car, and it's an awesome prayer. And the way I, I discovered it is this is St. Paul saying, For this reason also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So this is not my prayer. This is St. Paul's prayer. And St. Paul says, this is what I'm praying for you. It's Colossians 1, 9 through 12. That you might be filled with the knowledge of His, of His will, with wisdom and spiritual understanding. He wants you to know God's will. Number two, that you might walk worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him. Isn't that what you want to do in the morning? God, show me how I can walk so that my goal would be to please you. Number three, that I would be fruitful in every good work. Who doesn't want to be fruitful at their job or with your family or whatever? So that you would know His will, that you would please Him, that you would be fruitful. And then number four is increasing in the knowledge of Him. That's what prayer is. That's what Christianity is. That's what we're here for, to know Him more. So you want to know His will. You want to be pleasing to Him. You want to be fruitful in all that you do. And then you want to know Him. And then you say, give me strength with all might, according to your power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. You want to know the word that kills me right there? He says, you give me the strength. It says, long suffering with joy. How often do you hear the word long suffering and joy? You say, help me to endure difficult things with joy. That's saying, help me with all the things I'm going to go through today. And then lastly, giving thanks to the Father. Why are you giving thanks to the Father? Because He's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Wow. I've got worship. I've got gratitude. I've got discovering His will. I've got my own supplications in there. It takes you one minute to pray. I want everyone to begin to pray this prayer, but still set apart your time, your place, clear your mind, have your goal. Let's be prayer warriors.
told you I'm not going to come back next weekend. But I still want you to pray together with your spouse. Once. Once. We're going to pass out cards in a couple of weeks. If I stop being lazy and I order them. So you'll have things to pray for. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who loved us, the one who loved me, the one who gave himself for me, the one who accepted me, who has supported me, who has brought me and everyone I love into this hour, into this place. We thank you so much because you are a mighty God, a loving God, who does above all that we ask or imagine, whose peace passes all understanding. You are the God of all gods, and there is no other God like you. And we thank you, dear Lord, for this privilege to stand before you. I don't get to meet many people that are that incredible on this earth, but that I get to stand before you. I thank you for this honor and this privilege. I pray for your mercy and your forgiveness for having forsaken this incredible gift and power and this highest of privileges. Help me, O oh Lord, and help us all to have the desire to have that great positive experience in prayer where we could see you and sense your presence in our lives. Dear Lord, I know that prayer isn't supposed to be elusive. It's supposed to be interactive. I pray, dear Lord, that as we come to you this week, that you would meet us where we're at. I pray, dear Lord, that you would open our hearts, and I pray that you would break them, and I pray that you would crush them, and I pray that you would cleanse them, and I pray that you would fill them, and I pray that you would plant in them, I pray that you would change them, I pray that you would make them more beautiful the way that you want them to be. Dear Lord, we're offering you ourselves, we're offering you our hearts, we're offering you our families, we're offering you our homes, our jobs, our purposes, our wills, we want to be for you. We pray that this church would all Always be under your presence, always under your guidance, always guarded and led and blessed by you. And we pray that you be in our midst. I pray, dear Lord, so much for everyone to find the courage to pray, the time to pray, and I pray that you would be this there. We pray for those who are sad, we pray for those who are lonely, we pray for those who are suffering, whether it be in prisons those who do not know you, those who are lost. I pray for our persecutors. I pray for everyone who has no one to pray for them. We reach out unto you, and as you have loved them, teach us also to love them as well. The intercession of St. Mary, all your angels, all your saints who pray along with us, hear us when we are children, simply as your children with humble hearts cry to you with one voice saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.